Yes, greetings everybody joining me once again on this beautiful Sunday night. I'm so ecstatic and grateful that you are here with me once again. Um, you guys have been absolutely tremendous and faithful. Can y'all believe this is part 15? I don't know what we're doing. I'm just letting God like drive this ship. I'm like, God, how long are we going to do this? I'm going to just keep doing it until he says, okay, let's go that way. I hope that you're ready. This might be a um, coming for your life type message. Um, I'm not going to be before you long, but I am going to be strong. So I hope that you're ready. Go ahead and take your screenshot. Tag us. Let us know where you're from. If you're your first time in the room, say, this is my first time. If this is your 15th time, I want you to say, I've been here for every single part. I'm so honored to serve you. And I believe God has a customized word just for you. And it's coming for your edges on tonight. So I hope that you're ready. So if you would, um, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm going to do a little hopscotch. I'm going to read verse 1. And then I'm going to hop down to verses 6 and 7. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 is where we're going to start. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Now let's hop down to verse 6. Hop down to verse 6. It says, So it was when they came that he looked at Elip and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, I Don't look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Is there anybody thankful for that? That God does not see you how man sees you. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Father, I thank you that you bless this moment. You bless your word. Anoint my lips to be the PA system of heaven, O oh God. We are in high expectation for what you have to say to us. Encourage us, convict us, inspire us, motivate us, shape us, chisel us so that we can be the kingdom representatives that you have called us to be. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you drop in all caps in the room? Amen. 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 A verse of concern. Our clause of consideration lives and takes residence and is chilling in verse 1 of our foundational text where our biblical narrative asked us, asked us this important and imperative question that I would like to orbit around for the time that we have together on tonight. And that question is, how long? How long? How long will you mourn over Saul? How long will you be bitter? How long will you blame them? How long will you be angry? How long will you be insecure? How long will you hold on to that relationship that you will constantly keep justifying, but it's causing you to drift further and further away from devotion and further and further away from prayer? How long? How long will you hide that secret sin? How long will you cling on to that addiction, church family? I firmly feel for, for part 15 of this Try Me series, I have a question that I want you to ask yourself, and that is how long? How long? For part 15 of this Try Me series, this statement that I'm about to articulate to you might be a shock to others, but just a reminder and confirmation to others. And that statement is, if you did not know it, if you are a Christ follower, it always comes with the breakup. Always comes with the breakup. Somebody just came in the room, so let me repeat it and break it down to the lowest common denominator. If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be one who is a follower of the way, if you claim to be a believer and you are living a life that is led by the Spirit and yielded to the Spirit's unctions, if you claim to be a Christ follower, it is always followed by a breakup. 
When your relationship with God changes, your relationship with sin changes. When your relationship with sin changes, your relationship with God changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. The way you view people changes. What you're attracted to changes. Your preference changes. The things that you were silent on changes. Because we cannot be a fearful church and then expect to be a voice for a fearless generation. Everything changes. And life changes terrifies hell life change terrifies hell that's confirmation for somebody watching this message that you've been having hit after hit and trial after trial and blow after blow and you're wondering what in the world is going on that is just hell is nervous and the enemy is trying to see do I still have a grip on their emotions do I still have a grip on their mind do I still have a grip on their flesh or am I terrified because I'm thinking hell just lost one change change Change, it comes with change. Closeness comes with further. Close comes with further. The closer I get to purpose, the further I get from meaningless. The further I get from distraction, the closer I get to focus. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. The problem then becomes when we're saying, you know what? I don't want to break up with this. And I'm cool with Jesus being my side chick. (laughs) I'm cool with Jesus being my side chick. Nobody really knows that we're together, but I still want benefits and privileges from you. See, I, I think we should talk around this thought from this subject for part 15 of this Try Me series for the time that we have together. I would like to speak from this topic. We had to break up. Yeah, we had to break up. Can I get somebody to drop this comment in the room? It's over, boo-boo. It's, it's over. It's over. We had to break up. How, why not try moving on? I'll be moving on. Try moving on. We had to break up. And all I'm attempting to articulate to you is anybody who claims to follow Christ, it will always be shadowed by a breakup. It'll always be shadowed by a breakup. Peradventure, could this be the reason why our world has this unrest? Could it be that this is the reason there's so much tension in the world, and specifically in our nation, in America, it's because there is a group of people who claim to be with Jesus, but they haven't broke up with injustice. They they, they they claim to be with Jesus, but they haven't broke up with racism. They claim to be with Jesus, but they haven't broke up with the mindset that everybody deserves equality. And not just that particular issue. There's a lot of us who claim to be with Jesus, but we haven't broke up with that porn. Yeah, we haven't broke up with that vibrator. I'm coming all down your street. Yeah, we we haven't broke up with that secret addiction. We haven't broke up with getting faded and getting drunk. We haven't broke up with being silent and speaking up for each other. We haven't broke up with certain things and we're wondering, where is the power of God? And I believe God is saying, listen, if I'm coming into your life, I want you to know I come with the breakup. Somebody say breakup. Breakup. I come with the breakup. I need you to break up with your laziness when it comes to your spiritual disciplines. How long and how many more days will you allow to pass by with you not addressing the fact that you have allowed your Bible and prayer closet to be a dust collector? Jesus is saying, I come with the breakup. I'm your new babe, and I'm not cool with you staying in contact with your ex. I'm your new babe, and I'm not cool with you staying in contact with your ex-idols. Now, if you're watching this message, and if you were with somebody, you wouldn't like it. If they, the person that you're with, if they were in still contact with their ex, still sleeping with their ex, going on dates with their ex, liking the pictures on IG from an ex, you wouldn't like it. So how much more do you think Jesus, how much more do you think Jesus feels? He's like, listen, I'm your new babe, and I come with a breakup. And I don't want you to stay in contact with your ex. Stop staying in contact with stuff that you asked me to save you from. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. Samuel, I know that Saul was your boy. Yeah, Saul was your dude. He was your bro, but I'm over that. And I need you to move on. I'm not saying that it's not going to be difficult. I am saying that it's necessary. I'm not saying that this doesn't hurt, but I need you to move on. How long would you cry over that which I have rejected? 
How long will you cry over that relationship that my hand is not on? How long will you cry over a place that I'm not at? I need you to move on because if you don't move on, you won't be able to hear my forward instruction because you're remaining in form of reflection. Ooh, did y'all hear what I just said? You won't be able to hear my forward instruction because you're remaining in former reflection. I need you to move on. I need you to move on. Don't marinate on it. Don't revisit it. Don't think about it. And don't try to lie to yourself and be like, oh, maybe they changed. Maybe it's different. I feel God is like, no, the very reason why I ended is still there. The reason I brought you out is still there. The reason I changed your circle is still there. Trust me. I understand that it's difficult, but I have greater for you. And I understand it's okay for you to fight for somebody who loves you. But it's a problem if you're fighting for someone to love you. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. Jesus wrecks your plans when he sees that your plans will wreck you. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. You can't have me and have them. I come with the breakup. I come with the breakup. And I'm trying to get us to understand. I'm trying to get us to understand that a lot of us, we are mislabeling the beckoning of the Holy Spirit as moody. So you're like, man, I just feel some type of way. I'm just in this mood. I'm just in this funk. You know, I, I just feel frustrated. I just feel irritated. That, that, you know, there's just something that's not feeling right in, in my soul, in my body. That's not gas. <laughs> that's not gas. That's not what you ate last night. That is the beckoning of the Holy Spirit. Please listen. Because this is one of the lowest taught on the radar discussions on how to identify God's voice. It's when there is a tension on the inside of your soul. That is the beckoning of the Holy Spirit saying, let it go. Let it go. I know it hurts, but let it go. I know that this is all you've ever known, but let it go. I know that this is scary, but let it go. Because it's better for you to move forward than for you to stay stuck in the place and never experience the promises, the dreams, and the abundance that God has for you. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I come with the breakup. Let it go. Please hear me. You didn't lose what God had for you. You lost what was blocking what God has for you. Ah. I need to say that again. You didn't lose what God had for you. You lost what was blocking what God has for you. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and everybody under the sound of my voice, I feel as though my assignment, my task, the mandate that has been given to me on tonight for the time that we have together is to the best of my capability to assist to convince and persuade a people that you've been here for too long. You've been here for too long. You've been here for too long. How long will you lay in this doubt? How long will you lay in this bitterness? How long will you lay in this substance abuse? How long will you lay in depression? How long will you lay here? Some of us, some of us have been so lazy that we are getting spiritual bed sores. Spiritual bed sores. You know what a bed sore is? It's when you laid in a place for so long that you begin to bruise. You begin to bruise. And what if I told you the pain that you're feeling is not due to a devil? The pain that you're feeling is not due to a demon. But the pain that you're feeling is due to you not moving. The pain that you're feeling is due to you not letting this go. The pain that you're feeling is due to you not moving on. But ever so often... Heaven sends a woman of God. Ever so often, heaven sends a man of God that has some anointing on them that takes on the embodiment of a nurse. And I'm busting through your retina display on tonight, and I'm pushing you and saying, you know what? You've laid here for too long, and I don't want you to bruise. God has better. God has more. He wants to take you to a new dimension. He wants to take you to another realm. He wants you to go from glory to glory. He wants to take you to a different platform. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you wholeness. He wants to give you soundness. But you got to stop laying in this place. It's time for you to move. It's time for you to move. Because many times when we lay in this depression, see, I don't even think we, if we allow God to be the person that rearranges things, you'll see things from a different perspective. I want you to see this word depression, okay? Just just the word depression. If we could just put depression on the screen. I want you to see something. Because if God comes in your life 
and you really allow him to change you, if you really allow him to break up some things that you used to have in your life, right here, you see depression. But God says, you know what? If you allow me to come into your life and change some things around and rearrange, I don't see depression. I see I press on. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. If you allow God to come in your life, you'll see that the very thing that have you depressed is the very thing that God is using to press you to press on. And I don't know who this is for, but God is saying, press on. I know it hurt, but that is not the title of your life. That is just a chapter in your life. But for you to experience this new dimension of grace, for you to experience who I've called you to be, you have to break up with that. You have to break up with that. I can get the whole church to shout if I begin to say, God is about to walk you into a season where there's nothing but open doors. Everybody go, hey, thank you, Lord. God is about to send you to an area where there's nothing but open doors. But then if I say, God is about to send you into a season of closed doors, I don't hear nothing but crickets. <laughs> and I said it before, many times I believe we're mislabeling it. Perhaps it's not a closed door, it is a dressing room. Can I get everybody in the room, just say dressing room. Yeah, per perhaps it's a dressing room. I want you to see this. When you and I get saved, we have all of these garments, right? All of these garments. Now, God, you're coming into this dressing room. He has this white cloak for you because he doesn't see you by what you've done. He doesn't see you by your past he doesn't see you by your failures. This is what it looks like when you accept the Lord. You got all this guilt. You got all this shame. You got all this stuff you're dealing with. And God's saying, give it to me. We're going to close the door. Nothing's going to pop off. Because believe it or not, God does not get glory out of embarrassing you. God doesn't want you to fail publicly. But he doesn't mind if you fail privately. Because this is between me and you. I'm putting you in a dressing room. This is not a closed door. This is a dressing room. And you know why I'm putting you in this dressing room? Because you have a whole lot of Jacob on right now, but I know I've called you to be Israel. You have a whole lot of Abram on you, but I've called you to be Abraham. You have a whole lot of Simon on you. You bad. You'll cut somebody's ear off. But I've called you to be Peter. And so I have to close the door so you can take that layer off. You're like, God, I, I got so much shame. I, so much I went through. He said, okay, give me that. I, I'll take your shame. God, you don't know, I've, I've had an abortion. I've been a stripper. I used to sell drugs. God, I've, I've shot at people before. I have a horrible story. Said, I understand. Give me, give me your horrible story. Give me your history. And I'll tell you his story. Y'all missed it. <laughs> give me your history. And let me tell you about his story, about how he died for that. All your screw-ups have been hung up. God, but I, I just got so much fear. I don't know. I don't know if I can really trust that you're going to be a provider. I'm facing so much. He says, okay, I haven't given you that spirit. Just get that to me. I say, okay, God, I, I, what am I supposed to do about what my mama did? What am I supposed to do about all the pain and the childhood trauma? Because like we said a few weeks ago, I believe trauma is hell's attempt to put a bookmark on your story. And God, if I be honest, I haven't been able to read on based on what happened in that season of my life when I was 12, when I was 13, when my uncle took me down in the basement and said, it's tickle time, but it really touched me inappropriately. God, how am I supposed to get over that? How am I supposed to forgive him? He says, I understand it hurt. Give me all your childhood trauma. Give it all to me. Give it all to me. God, I, I'm lonely. And so I keep making decisions that are detrimental for my purpose. Because you said that you're going to be there for me, but I don't feel your presence. I, I really feel alone many times. Okay, I understand. Give me your loneliness. I have a new garment that I want you to wear. Then when it comes to a particular garment, somebody say, uh-oh. There, there's always this one thing that we don't want to give up. <laughs> there's always, now we want to put on. A clean slate. We want to put this on, but it's like, man, I love my money, though. <laughs> I, I love my money. I, you know, God, I, 
God ain't through with me yet. You understand? You know, I, I love my money. Lord, I, 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 can't, <laughs> I can't do it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, you've been awesome and, and you've been great, but I love my money. And maybe this is not money. This could be your lust. God, I, I understand that you're awesome and all, but I, uh, I, I really can't let this go. And so this is the crazy thing. Samuel is in this place, and God asks him this question. He says, how long will you mourn over Saul? And this makes me begin to think, maybe you're really not waiting on God. Maybe God is like, I'm waiting for you to take that off. Because you are not coming out this room until you take this off, because there's a new wardrobe I want you to put on. There's something else I want you to put on. Here's the thing. God loves us so much that he'll be patient. He'll be like, okay, I'll wait. You like that jacket? Go ahead and wear it. Go ahead and pose in it. But you ain't going nowhere. You're not going to live on, under an open heaven. You're not going to experience my abundance. You're not going to experience next level blessings. You're not going to get any revelation. You're not going to get any understanding. You're going to constantly be in situations where you're deceived by people because you keep on wearing something. And I said, you got to break up with it. You got to break up with it. And here's the thing that I want us to understand. Whenever you're about to level up, that also requires for you to update your standards. See, and this is the dangerous thing. There are a lot of people who they came to Christ with all of this baggage. And there's one thing that they don't want to let go. And here's the problem. But all their friends are still wearing all of these outfits. And anytime it's time to change who you are. That often requires for you to change who you're with. Because all your friends are dressed in this. But God is saying, I need you to be dressed in this. But you like, God, I love this. And he's like, okay, as long as you love this, you can't put on this. You can't put on this. And then we'll mistake it. Move this out of the way for a second. We'll mistake it. And then we'll say, Jerry, I feel stuck. (laughs) I feel like I'm in this just stuck season, man, and I I don't know what's wrong. I feel like I ain't hearing from God, you know. I just don't feel his presence anymore. I I, I just feel stuck. And I believe the Lord gave me um, an acronym for stuck. Anytime you feel stuck, could it be because you're still trying ungodly connections knowingly? God, that's good. Could it be the reason you stuck is because you still trying? ungodly connections knowing that God wants you to put on a new outfit. So are you really stuck? Are you really stuck? Is it that God is not really answering your prayers? Or is it I'm not really being obedient? I'm not really being obedient. And here's the crazy thing. Later on, I'm getting ahead of myself. In this text, Samuel goes up to Jesse's house. And the first thing he says when he sees Elip is, wow, this is the Lord's anointed. And I'm like, man, how how is this dude who hears from God about to pick really wrong? How is a real man of God about to be really wrong? Could it be he didn't heal right? And when you don't heal right, you can't undress right. You can't undress right. So a lot of us are in this season of our lives where we're like, man, I just, I want to feel his presence. God has said, I'm ready for you to feel my presence. But how long will you justify this garment that I'm telling you to take off? How many more messages must you hear? How many more try me series and try me sermons or whatever sermons that you're binging? How many more messages will you hear until this begins to itch you so much? Until this begins to get so uncomfortable that you have no choice but to take it off? God is saying, listen, I want to take you higher, but you got to take this off. You got to get rid of this because I need you to put on a new wardrobe. Now, before we put this on, my wife and I were on a cruise a few years ago. And when we were on this cruise, there was this block of ice, just this regular chunk of ice. And then this artist came out and he spent some time chiseling on this ice. But it started off as just a block of ice. I want you guys to see this, just a regular old block of ice. Nothing special about it, nothing unique about it. It was just a block of ice. And so I'm sitting there just looking at this dude. I'm like, I wonder what he's going to do with it. And he begins to chisel away, and he just spends some time chiseling. And then after about 30 minutes, he took a block of ice, 
and turn into an ice sculpture. I'm sitting here like, wow, how did this man create something so beautiful from just a block of ice? And I believe the Holy Spirit was revealing to me the beauty was there the whole time. They just had to surrender with being chiseled. What's on the inside of you, it's been there the whole time. There's just extra layers of ice that God's saying, listen, if you allow me to chisel that, everything that you've been called to be, everything that I'm trying to do in your life, every single place that I want to take you, I could do it, but you got to allow me to chisel you. And I don't know who I'm speaking to, but I feel I'm coming for somebody's life right now. God is saying, when, 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 when will you allow me to chisel you? You've been crying every night. You've been complaining for years about what you don't like. And I'm telling you, I don't have you in a closed door season. I have you in a dressing room season. But you got to take off the garment. You got to take off the garment because there's something else that I want you to wear. There's something else that I want to put on your life. You have to break something off your bloodline, girl. You have to break something off your bloodline, dude. There's something I need you to put on. There's holiness I need you to put on. There's understanding that I need you to put on. There's purity that I need you to put on. Because I got to send you to a generation. I got to send you to a people. I got to send you to a community. I got to send you to a, to a government. I got to send you to a place where you can represent me and I have a new wardrobe I want to put on you. But are you willing to give all this stuff up? of your past and say, God, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. And whatever you want to do in my life, however you need to chisel me, however you need me to be, whatever you need to do, God, I'm willing to do it. Everything that is not you, God, take it. And everything that is you, God, I want it. That's the place where God wants us to get to. And I firmly believe that God is talking to somebody on the night and he's saying, when are you going to allow for me to chisel you? So I believe there's this travel paradigm. There's this travel paradigm naturally and then also in our world. There's this travel system. Every time I go to an airport, I see the same language. Departure, layover, arrival. Departure, layover, and arrival. And it's the same thing with our faith with God. We have a departure season. You know what your departure season is? That's your dressing room. That's the season where God is getting you to take everything off that doesn't look like him. That's the season where all the pain of your past, God is getting you to take that off. That's your departure season. And believe it or not, there are some people who never depart because they never want to get naked. <laughs> they, they never want to hang all their past up so they never could depart. And then here's the crazy thing. After you depart, sometimes you have a layover. Anybody ever had a layover? I've had a layover one time for six hours. Layover. This is a season a lot of us don't like because this one you got to wait. But if you really break down what the layer, layover is for, number one is for you to connect. Maybe God has you in the place that you're in right now because there's some people he needs you to connect with. There are some people who have influence he needs you to connect with because of where you're going. Number two, layovers are when people who started with you People who started with you, they not going with you. And a lot of times we get hurt because we think the very people who departed are also going to be the people who arrived. But no, we're switching flights. This is how far they can go with you for this journey. And I said it before, a lot of us, we have to be like an outer service elevator to people. When they come in our lives and they push our buttons, you don't have to go to the floor that they demanded. I'm out of order to your request. I don't have to go to the floor of anger. I don't have to go to the floor of clapping back. I don't have to go to the floor of being petty. I don't have to go to the floor of lust. I'm out of service to you. God has pre-programmed for you to go to the top. Everybody watching this. God has pre-programmed for you to go to the top. What we have to do is when people get off on, four fly, on, on the fourth floor, don't press door open. Let them go. Let that door close. Somebody say close. Don't you just sit there and be holding it with a door. Let the door close. You know why? Because if you keep level five people with you, the level 20 people that God has for you to... The level 20 people that's coming into your life, if you keep level 5, level 6, level 7, level 8, level 9, level 10, if you keep all these levels, by the time you get to this level, there's no space for the people that God has to come into your life because you're holding on to stuff that God is saying, break up. 
You got to break up a level six. You got to break up a level seven. You got to break up a level eight. I know they've been there since level one, but they're not going to be conducive for you at level 20. God is the author of your story, and he can see right now who you're with in chapter seven is going to be hurtful for your chapter 20. So I have to remove them right now. I have to remove them right now. So when the door closes, let it close. And another thing about elevators, they have a weight capacity. <laughs> they have a weight capacity. If you keep holding on to too much, you ain't going nowhere. Maybe this is why your life feels so weighty. Maybe this is why you feel like you have so much weight. You're holding on to stuff that you're supposed to break up with at level two, three, four, five. God, why is God coming so hard like this? There's some stuff God saying, hey, you can't go to that level with that. I know that's all you've ever known, but you can't go with that. You have to leave that behind. And then the third part, arrival. That's your aha moment. That's your this is why moment. And some people never have it. They never embrace the aha moment because they never let God remove it. They never broke up with it, so they never really experienced the layover. And here's the thing about layovers. You best stay by the gate. <laughs> you got to stay by the gate. If they say, this is the last call, flowers, last call, flowers. If you're not at that gate and you way down at Chili's trying to get you some of them egg rolls because you were hungry, if you out of position, if you out of position, when they call for you to board, you will miss your flight. And then now your layover turns into a stayover because you're out of position. God has said, hey, I understand it don't seem like stuff's bored in your life right now. Stay by my feet. I understand it seems like stuff's not popping off in your life the way that you want it to pop off. Stay by my feet. I understand you haven't got the understanding and you haven't got the clarity yet that you want to get. Just stay by my feet so that when I call your name, you can board your flight. Departure, layover, and arrival. So how, how, how do we get stuck? How do we get stuck? Point number one. I firmly believe it's because we haven't mourned right. We haven't mourned right. Samuel is a prophet of God. Samuel is a prophet of God. Israel wanted a king. God never wanted for his people to have a king. He wanted to be their only king. But they wanted to be like the nations around them. So God gave them what they asked for. Because I believe sometimes God gives us what we ask for so that the next time he says no, you won't question him. <laughs> he gave them what they asked for. God gave him an assignment. I need you to execute judgment on this town. He doesn't do it. He keeps some of the stuff from himself. Samuel rolls up on the scene. He's still hearing goats and he still hears cows. And it's like, okay, what are you doing, bro? And Saul began to be like, calm down, man. Listen, uh, I'm going to sacrifice all this for the Lord. And then Samuel asked him this question. Some of us heard this before. Is not obedience better than sacrifice? God tells Saul, because he didn't obey me, tell Samuel, because he didn't obey me, I'm going to strip the kingdom from him and give it to somebody better. So this messed Samuel up. Samuel of the crown, my boy. This is my dude. I don't understand how they didn't listen. I tried to help him. He's crying, and God's like, hey, man, uh, how long you going to mourn over that? <laughs> how, how long you going to cry over him? I rejected him, bro. I already have another king, and I need you to go. See, some of us, this is a word for you. You crying over a fool. You crying over a joke, and God's like, I got a king, girl. You, you crying over this girl, I, I got a queen. And this always isn't relationally. A lot of us were in foolish places. But God is going to give you a kingdom upgrade. And you're like, how long are you going to continue to cry over that? Don't you understand I got better for you? It says, you go fill your home with oil and you go to Jesse's house. I have a king amongst his sons. And so he gets to Jesse's house. And look at this, verse 6. He gets to Jesse's house and it says, so it was when they came that he looked at Elip and said, surely... The Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, hold on, wait a minute. Don't look at his appearance. And I'm like, hold on, bro, hold on. You, you're a prophet, man. He's not like these prophet liars that we hear today. This dude was about to give a prophet. He was about to prophet lie. <laughs> he was about to anoint the wrong king. And I'm like, how does a man of God, how does one who hears from God about to pick wrong? Until I begin to do a little research, maybe... He didn't mourn right. 
Because Saul was 6'4", broad, swole, 200 plus. He looked like a king. Elam is tall, 6'4", broad, looked like a king. I want you to see this. When you don't allow God to heal you, you'll keep going back and picking what you used to have. Golly, I hope y'all are seeing this. Look, he was used to this. And God said, hey, I'm no longer there. I need you to move on. So a lot of us, you moved on for the situation, but you haven't moved on from the pain. And when you don't move on, when you don't heal right, you won't pick right. <laughs> so you are going to keep dating the same dude that has got a different name. You're going to keep on entertaining the same type of depression, just a different name. The same type of addiction, just different name. Because when you don't heal right, you can't pick right. And so I believe in that moment, Samuel was picking his history because pain blinded him from seeing God's destiny. What he went through hurt him so much that he wasn't able to see you picking the same king. And I don't know who this is for, but I wonder, are you picking the same thing but expecting different results? Got to heal right. And because he didn't heal right, he was about to pick the wrong one. And I'm just trying to encourage somebody. Maybe the reason you're stuck, it's not always because you're still trying ungodly connections knowingly. Sometimes you're stuck because you haven't healed. You haven't healed, and so you keep picking your pain. Because you have a trauma bond and you're used to the pain, you're used, it's possible for you to get so used to dysfunction that you choose dysfunction. And you think what is functional is actually dysfunctional. But no, you just learn how to function with a dis. Okay. <laughs> we have it more than right. Point number two sometimes the reason we're stuck is because we haven't released. We haven't released. There's something that God is saying, hey, I need you to let this go so that you could go. I want you to see a snapshot real quick of the story with Jonah, right? God gave Jonah some instructions. He says, hey, I need you to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because those people are like bullies to his people. And so I want you to catch this. He gets on this boat. He's heading to Joppa. Let's hop down to verse 9. Jonah chapter 1, verse 9. All this stuff is happening. This storm is going on. And they're like, man, what's going on? They, they confront Jonah. And Jonah says, um, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Sidebar, anytime you're hanging or dating with somebody who's running from God, you're harboring a fugitive. So whatever they experience, you're going to experience because you're trying to harbor somebody who's running. That's for free. I don't know who that's for. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what shall we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Jonah's like, I'd rather die than obey. <laughs> Pick me up in the sea. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. And I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to roll back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. What if you're going through something because you have a Jonah on your boat? You have a Jonah in your life. This is not even your storm. And you don't have to get away from a storm that's not yours. You don't have to get away from a storm that's not yours. And these people were stuck because of who was on board. When Jonah was on board, there was a storm. When Jonah was overboard, there was peace. When Jonah was on board, there was a storm. When Jonah was overboard, there's peace. Who have you let board your life that's still in your peace? And maybe that's the reason you're stuck. Or you could be scared to let them go, but I want to encourage you. Your destiny is never tied to who left. Your destiny is never tied to who left. And sometimes, just like these sailors, and if you were to really break down the story, the Bible says they begin to throw their cargo overboard. The stuff that they needed to keep him. What are you throwing overboard to keep what God is saying? That has to go overboard. Because I'm trying to take you to another dimension. Last point. We haven't discovered or remembered our assignment. Maybe this is why you're stuck. Because you haven't discovered and you don't remember your assignment. Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul? 
seeing I have rejected him as king. I need you to fill your horn with oil and go to Jesse's house. If you know anything, we talked about this with oil. This is anointing. I'm seeing in this text, God is saying, look, bro, there's a level of anointing that you'll never have until you move on. And I don't know who this is for. There's a level of oil God wants to pour on you, but you'll never be able to receive it if you don't move on. And not just that. It was his job to anoint the next king. You will never, never be able to be an effective oil carrier if you don't move on. You're so hurt by what they did. It was messed up. It was painful. But you have oil on your life to break some things, and you have oil on your life to pour on somebody. And until you break up with this, you'll never arrive into that. It is not God's will that you stay in departure. He wants you to arrive. I want you to consider what is God calling for you to break up with? It's not always a person. Sometimes it is. It's not always a person. But if you're watching this, I believe the Spirit of God is saying, hey, I come with breakups. I come with breakups. And the only way you're going to go there is you got to break up with what's here. So God, we bless you. We understand that you're not cool with being a side chick. You want total commitment, total faithfulness, total obedience so that we can be surrendered to you because you have what's best for our lives, God. Help us to trust you because you're not cool with us staying in contact with our ex. God, we ask that you give us the strength to embrace the dressing room and take off whatever garment, take off whatever fear, take off whatever depression, take off anxiety, take off the stress so that we can put on your glory. Help us to put on the garment of praise. Help us to understand that worship focuses and shifts our focus to the problem solver versus the problem. And whatever it is in our life, we have to end so that our spiritual life can begin. Give us the strength so that we could be your vessels and your representatives. In Jesus' name, amen.